Good evening, everyone, and thank you for turning out on this cold evening. Feels like the first day of winter. Um, there's quite a lot to get through, so I think we should just get cracking. Um, so I'm going to read out the citations of the incoming RDIs, and um, you'll be able to see them and their work. So the first one, Patrick Bellew, environmental engineer, was described by Dan Epstein, London 2012 Head of Sustainability, as the environmental granddad of it all. This captures Patrick's position as the leader of the field in his eco-generation. As founder of Atelier 10, Patrick has spent his working life increasing the environmental performance of buildings, <coughs> reducing their energy demands and their carbon footprint in dramatic fashion, often by more than 50%. On an individual project basis, this is important, but taken as environmental prototype designs, and coupled with his technical evangelism, this body of work has a global impact with significant benefits for everyone. When we realize that the UK's environmental footprint is three times the global average, and the US nearly six times, it becomes very clear how significant is Patrick's pioneering contribution in bringing down these figures to tackle the twin global challenges of climate change and sustainable living for all of us. Patrick's projects, mostly in the public domain, are noted for their innovation as well as their sustainability. He often uses the natural world for technical inspiration, and his favorite bit of biomimicry is the nest of the termite. From termites, he has learned how to naturally condition buildings using free ground cooling, free air flow, to dramatically improve their environmental performance. These techniques, have been, these techniques have been researched and then used on many projects, with civic and cultural work of all scale all over the world. As European thinking has been ahead of the US, Patrick established a New York office in 2000 to work with the burgeoning green community there in the days before the inconvenient truth. As a result, the best new architecture, both in Europe and in the US, now has an environmental designer working very closely with the architect from the outset. Although ethereal, Patrick's work nevertheless has a high aesthetic quality and great intellectual elegance. It is more about touch, hearing, and even smell and life support than pure visual beauty. He has served as a visiting tutor at architecture programs including the Architectural Association and the Bartlett in London. And for more than 10 years, he has been teaching the core environmental design course to students at Yale University School of Architecture, where he is now Aero Sarinen visiting professor. Under Patrick's direction, Atelier 10, now over 100 strong, were chosen as Sustainable Consultant of the Year in 2009 by the UK Building Council. Patrick is evangelical about his work and blessed with excellent communication skills. More of that later. In the meantime, it is our pleasure to welcome you, Patrick Bellew, to the Faculty of Royal Designers. Peter Clegg is senior partner of one of the country's leading sustainable architecture practices, Field and Clegg Bradley Studios, FCBS for short. Ever since the practice started 30 years ago in a shop front office in Bath, FCBS has been guided by social and environmental principles that have impacted on both the output of the practice and the clients that it attracts. 
The environmental strand of the practice's work came originally from Peter's Masters in Environmental Design at Yale during the 1974 world oil crisis. He led the practice to develop a commitment to energy saving in architecture long before the significance of CO2 emissions and global warming was recognized. Early competition wins were characterized by a low energy approach to design, but the practice also generated its own experimental passive solar housing schemes in the early 80s using development capital raised by Peter Clegg and his partner Richard Fielden. This led to the new headquarters of Greenpeace UK and further competition successes produced the new environmental office for the building research establishment and the National Trust headquarters in Swindon, both of which became precedent low energy buildings. <clears throat> FCBS traditionally located itself firmly in the public sector and the community architecture movement. Now it extends beyond this to creating projects in the developing world, which are sponsored either by the practice or through the Richard Fielden Foundation, set up after Fielden sadly died young. Completed projects include a new clinic at the University of Masuzu, Malawi, an outdoor stage and teaching area for an orphanage in Chennai, homes for AIDS orphans in South Africa, and two new schools in Uganda. The practice believes that this work helps it to keep a perspective on the professional work that it undertakes, and it provides unique experience for young members of the practice to get involved in challenging third world projects. Peter makes many pro bono contributions. He is a trustee of the British Council for Schools Environments, the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, and Jamie's Farm, a trust which provides a therapeutic rural environment for children on the verge of exclusion from schools. From its modest beginnings in Bath, FCBS now has an office in London. Here it runs free exhibitions and seminars to bring architecture more into the public eye raising the level of debate on how social and environmental concerns in the built environment can help shape society. In typically altruistic fashion, the first event in their new space was not a glitzy celebration of the work of the practice, but a reflective discussion on new cooperative and employee trust models of ownership for creative practices of all kinds. Peter Clegg, I have a feeling you're gonna fit in really well with the RSA. <laughs> and the Royal Designers, and it's a great pleasure for us to welcome you to the faculty. <clears throat> Sir Terence Conran is quite simply one of the founding fathers of the design world as we know it today. His contribution over the past 60 years has touched most design disciplines, from furniture, textiles and products, to architecture and interiors. His CV traces a remarkable journey of triumphs and challenges, from the soup kitchen in 1953 to his ongoing and irrepressible career today. Terence is a tenacious and determined person, committed to the idea that good design is a good thing. It is essential to our quality of life and should be available to as many people as possible. To achieve this, he has made it, commissioned it, specified it, sold it, built it, printed it, made museums of it. Above all, he has lived it, and with a passion, there is an altruistic side to Terence too. In 1980, he established the Conrad Foundation, a charitable fund dedicated to educating the public and British industry about the value of good design. In 1981, the Boiler House opened at the V&A, and in 1989, the Design Museum opened at Butler's Wharf. I plan to take a group of students from the RSA Academy in Tipton to the Design Museum shortly after Christmas. This altruistic streak extends to countless helping hands given to individual designers at the early stages of their careers. RDI Thomas Heatherwick, for example. 
Terence's great achievement and his significant benefit to society has been to promote simple, elegant, and functional design for all of us to buy and then to live with and enjoy. Designers in particular owe Terence Conran a great debt of gratitude for helping to design the very environment within which our work is possible. I know that my own career has been greatly helped by the raised awareness of good design by manufacturers and retailers through his massive influence. So I'm very happy to have this opportunity to thank you personally, Terence, and on behalf of the Royal Designers and the RSA to welcome you to the Faculty of Royal Designers. is thrilled to get this and thank you Robin very much um, I was particularly struck sitting there in the Royal Society the encouragement of arts and manufacturers that's the problem that we face in this country and in particular my worry particularly as provost of the Royal College we appear to have what I suppose calls themselves government, who doesn't seem to have any interest in the creative industries. Maybe the Royal, Royal Society can do something to offer that encouragement, because there won't be designers in the future if we don't have manufacturing in this country. And who wants to be a member of a country that doesn't make anything. Making things is terrifically important for employment, obviously, and for designers. Designers can't design in a vacuum. They have to design hand in hand with a manufacturer. And that is something that is very difficult if not impossible to do. Look at Stoke-on-Trent, for instance, devastated, center of the wonderful British ceramics industry, as you well know, Robin. And we simply have to do something about it. It can't go on like this. And finally, I'd like to say thank you, Jaguar. One of my happiest moments was when I bought an E-type Jaguar. <laughs> but I always felt as if I was driving this car with its long, sloping bonnet, as if I'd got a boil on the end of my nose. I'm sure I'm gonna hit something in this car. I didn't, but I did enjoy that car enormously. So it's wonderful for me to have um, this honor that you've helped sponsor. Thank you. I think Terence might have made a bit of history there. I think that's probably the first time an incoming RDI has made a speech. <laughs> but for you, Terence, of course, that's fine. <laughs> that was really delightful. Okay, um, Edward Cullinan has worked as an architect for over 50 years with the increasing and sustained excellence. A, con a, a concern for social benefit appears to flow naturally from his highly sensitive aesthetic. Ted conceived his architectural practice as a cooperative in the 1960s, and all members have a stake in 
maintaining both the design and social quality of the output. This is an essential element of an altruistic architecture that rates social opportunity above form without losing sight of the pleasure to be had from aesthetic surroundings. From early on, he crusaded for a self-build self approach to people's homes. This informs his work to this day as he delights in trying out design ideas through the hands-on experience of construction. His headquarters for Ready Mix Concrete International was one of the first prestige office buildings to have its climate controlled without the installation of a central heating and cooling system. Ted is also an active and enthusiastic educator, holding no less than four visiting professorships. He is a committed guardian of altruistic intentions as chairman of Urban Vision for North Staffordshire, as an active trustee of the Soan Museum and the Kerstler Award Trust for Art in Prisons, to name just a few. He should also be seen as a designer of memorable welcomes by drawing in and putting the public at ease at a host of locations, including Fountains Abbey Visitor Centre, the John Hope Gateway Building and the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh, and the Herbarium and Library Wing at Kew Gardens. To quote Ted, my work has always tried to show evidence of experimentation, playfulness, and above all, architectural eloquence, coupled with a deep sense of both social and environmental responsibility. My commitment to sustainability is not a recently acquired reaction to global warming fears. It is part of a broad humanist grounding that lies behind all my work and that of Edward Cullinan Architects. Of a recent commission at Maggie's Farm at Freeman Hospital in Newcastle, Ted states that Maggie's centres aim at a wonderful balance of the moral with the aesthetic. This is a balance that I think all royal designers, indeed all good designers, would identify with. Sadly, Ted is unwell and unable to join us this evening. However, we're pleased that his wife, Roz, and daughter, Kate, are here and I would like to invite Roz to receive Ted's diploma on his behalf. Thank you, Roz, and please wish Ted a speedy recovery. David Watkins has built up an amazingly impressive and beautiful body of work since he graduated with a BA in sculpture in 1963. What is truly remarkable is that he has managed to achieve this sustained excellence as a jewelry designer and maker despite the distractions of semi-professional jazz playing, model making for films, music publishing, not to mention 23 years as professor of goldsmithing, silversmithing, metalwork and jewellery at the Royal College of Art. David's designs combine great precision with graphic forms, yet they have a surprising warmth. Not content with conventional materials for making jewellery, he has pioneered the use of steel, aluminium, acrylic and colour core melamine, as well as neoprene coatings. He was one of the first jewellery designers to use the computer as a design tool in the early 1970s when design software was in its infancy. Through his progressive and innovative use of materials and process, he has enriched and extended the possibilities of form, surface and composition for all designers, not just jewellers. His pioneering spirit has been there from the early days of his career. During the liberation of social behavior in the 1960s, he worked with Wendy Ramshaw on jewelry made from cheap materials like perspex and even paper that sold for pennies. He played his part in that heady pop art period that freed millions of people to express themselves without spending a king's ransom. Beyond enriching our lives with beautiful jewelry, David's contribution to society lies with his long teaching career at the Royal College a period defined by former rector of the RCA, Christopher Frayling, as the Watkins era. Concerned that his course could lead too heavily towards craft, he established a production unit element 
that every student had to undertake. The brief was to design something that had to be produced in quantity with the technicians or a manufacturer. The impact of this educational innovation has been profound, with many students gaining an understanding of how their work can reach a wider public and be of a greater social relevance. David's retirement from the RCA in 2006 was immediately followed by his appointment as Emeritus Professor and Director of the Center of Jewelry Research at the RCA. This underlies his ongoing commitment to education and research. I am confident that the polymath, that is David Watkins, will bring much to the RC RSA and to the Royal Designers, and we are delighted to welcome him to the faculty. Ant Hills to Labyrinths, Engineering Sustainable Architecture. I have to admit that when I learned about the technical inspiration that Patrick Bellew gets from termites, I had to suggest a break with tradition and ask an incoming RDI to give our address. Patrick, you have described your work in many, as in many ways invisible. It is through collaboration and communication with architects and other designers that you deal in the media of air, light, and water to deliver more efficient buildings. It's really cool that you'll be expelling some hot air to deliver a very efficient address for us tonight. Excuse that, I'm sorry. So Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, I'm looking at my computer and seeing my, I'm not on the first slide, so can I switch to the, um, to the first slide, please? In fact, can I switch to my computer at all? Ah, there we are. Well, um, thank you very much for inviting me to give this lecture. It's, a, it's an incredible honor to receive this award, and in, in such company, um, I, I used to go to Peter's shop uh, in the architecture shop in Bath when I was a graduate from the Bath School of uh, Architecture and Engineering. Um, I, I worked with Sir Terence many years ago on the Bluebird, Bluebird Garage, and I've recently been working with Ted um, and in his office on, on projects. And I think the, the thanks to, to the RSA, to the RDIs, for recognizing my field of engineering. Um, when I started the training, I thought I was learning about pipes and wires and ducts, which probably wouldn't normally win an excitement award in getting you into an institution like this. Um, but over the years, the, the, the work that we do as environmental designers has become much more part of the collaborative endeavor that is modern architecture. And um, it's, it's incredibly valuable, I think, for our profession to have uh, an award like this. Um, I mean, to myself, I'm obviously delighted, but for the profession generally, um, because it, it speaks to the fact that the, the building services engineer or the environmental engineer is very much a key part of the, of the process and the product of, of architecture, design, and construction. Um, my friend Andy said that has, has a thing that he, where he says, uh, Andy Bow from, from Foster's, who I've been teaching with recently, says that you must always dedicate a lecture to somebody to make it important. And I, I'd like to dedicate this to my mum, who was supposed to come tonight. Um, sadly, she's not very well, but she didn't come. But um, for her, this lecture. Sustainability is a really huge subject. Um, climate change is an even bigger one. And I think whether it's education, big society, or the new Green Deal, there are lots of people talking a lot about sustainability. I'm probably not going to talk too much about the, the, the really big issues because I think what the RSA is about is about ideas in action. It's about everybody doing something to, 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 to have, their, have their say or do their piece. And I think it's, it's certainly in the, the, the people who are tonight on those RDIs are people who get on and do it. And I think so what I'm going to talk to you tonight about is about ideas in action and some of the real projects of the last 25 years that I've collaborated with um, people, including many of the uh, current RDIs, that I'll name check as we go along. It's about ideas, innovation, enterprise, and collaboration. Often it's about a fight against the naysayers, the people who say, oh, you can't do that, they suck on their teeth, they say, that's not, this isn't possible, this can't be done. Um, and so often what we're doing is, is pushing back against people who, who really aren't interested in taking this agenda further. And I put into that category frequently property um, people in the, in the advising property um, developers and so on who will always try and do uh, as, as little as possible to, to, do, to do well, which is a great shame. That's changing. Legislation is changing that. 
corporate social responsibility is starting to change that. We're at a, po a point where um, this thing is accelerating. Um, but no single person in our teams of designers, architects, engineers, holds the, 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 the complete banner of sustainability. Everybody has to take part in this to make it really work. As I was doing my homework um, for, this, for this lecture, and believe me, you do homework when you get asked to do a lecture like this, I came across a, um, a, uh, a piece that was written by a guy called Leonard Reed in 1959, the year of my birth, called I Pencil. Have any of you read I Pencil? Pencil. Humble object. And a humble object that, and he points out in his lecture, that no, in, his, in, his, in his essay, that nobody on the planet knows how to make a pencil from scratch. If I asked any of you in the room to make a pencil from scratch, I don't think anybody could do it because you have to find a way of, 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 of chopping down the tree, of cutting the cedar to the, the right gauge, to chopping the incisions into it so it folds away, to mine the graphite, to, uh, to form it into this perfect cylinder that you wrap the thing around, the, the paint that goes on the outside, the, the bezel of, of brass that holds the eraser that comes from the rubber plant. Nobody can do this. It's all about collaboration. It's about trade. It's about how you put things together as a manufacturer and, and Obviously, Sir Terence is the, the, the ultimate in, in pulling all these things together and making, great, and making things of design. But even at the humblest level, the pencil represents almost the impossible to us. So imagine if you extrapolate that and you try to say, if that's sustainable, how would you extrapolate that to a building? At that point, all the fuses blow and you go, oh my God, this is, this is a problem that's just too hard to deal with. Um, and so, in a sense, that's, that's, kind of, that's, that's where I start from. But then if you look at our, our, our industry and you compare it to other industries of the last, of the last millennium. Um, the dif distant difference between this paper and string machine from 1903 to 1969 when Concord was built. This enormous you know, common enterprise that built the most, that moved things forward so quickly. Telephony over the last few, you know, over the last generation from, from, the, from 100 years before, 100 years ago when Bell invented the telephone to this great milestone, the first of the portable telephones. But where we are today with a bamboo biodegradable telephone, amazing. But that's, that's all about collaboration and focus on a single thing, and buildings tend not to have that kind of that luxury. Our office in New York is just down the, square, down the street from Madison Square here, and this is the very famous Flatiron building. This photograph comes from the 1920s, and most of you won't spot what's interesting to me as an environmental engineer. But what's interesting to me as an environmental engineer is the shades on the windows. And if you go back today, in 2010, what you see sticking out of the windows of the Flatiron building is air conditioning units, and they strip the shades off. That, in a sense, if that's progress in our industry, that's a terrible thing. Now, I'm, it's, a, it's a very uh, particularly difficult example, but that is, tends to be how our industry has progressed in very many ways over the last, gener over the last century. And, of course, in the, the 20th century, the dash for technology, uh, inspired by the Bauhaus and by um, uh, Mies, among, among, among many others, was a move towards the technology of building that allowed transparency, that allowed you know, iron frame buildings that, would cre that, could cre that could be lightweight in the way that the skins worked, and a complete decoupling of architecture from environment. So we have a generation of people who have, of basically, of designers who grew up with a de decoupling facades from, um, from, the, from the experience of the inside of the building. And that led, of course, to, to the air conditioning engineer, my, my progenitors, if you like, the air conditioning engineer whose job it was to produce enough watts of cooling to keep the building comfortable. Now, that isn't a way to start to build sustainable work, but that is still how many design teams are put together, that the architect, um, fortunately not so much in the UK these days, but certainly in the States, the architect designs the buildings, the engineer puts the air conditioning in. And that isn't what collaborative working and about integrative working is all about. And I'm maybe going to try and talk to you now about that in the, in, the, in the times to come. And of course, what's happened as a result of that is a, a, a series of buildings around Europe. That you can, I mean, you can poke fun at these. I have to have fun with this because this is a, a, this is a national book archive in France. Uh, it's the, the, the national book archive. Now, when did you ever meet a book that needed a good view or sunshine? And this is, you know, if you, are, if you talk about glass as a, as a pragmatic instrument, it's a, it's a thing that lets light out, lets light in, lets heat in and out, and it provides a view. There you have a building that's designed to, as, a, as an archive for books that's made entirely out of glass and has huge energy demands. That is, you know, that's at the point at which We've tipped over into ludicrousness about in, in the way that buildings are designed, and I'm sorry to the architects involved. But of course, you then get the, you know the the, 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 the knock-on effect is that glass is the is as the as the is the element that we all use in, in, trans, in transparent buildings. So this is a uh, the, the enigmatically titled Parliament View Apartments down on the down on the embankment, and as you go there, you know all, all you ever see is every blind shut, so nobody's getting a view of anything. Um, this is the ITN building with its all its shades. Every shade on that building is always down. 
um, but it's all glass, so it's lots of heat coming in and out. And this is the usual view you get of London buildings with um, the, the blinds coyly revealing the rubbish that sits in the lower part of the window. Now, we've got to get away from this as a way of designing. This is not sensible design. This is not how we should be designing buildings. So, to the termite. They've had the big build-up tonight, so I'm going to have to do well at this part of my talk. So, the termite is, a, is an animal that's not, never been to architecture school. Um, it's, uh, they, they, they exist in colonies of, of um, two to three million, and they build their nests responding to some very key environmental principles. The first one, if you take the magnetic termite or the compass termite in Australia, is one of orientation of the, of the structure. So the, the nests are oriented precisely north-south to minimize the exposure to solar gain of the, uh, the nest at the hottest part of the day. Um, the queen basically lives in the central chamber and she likes to be kept very comfortable. She likes to be kept warm, in the, warm at night and, and cool, in the, cool in the daytime. And they do that by the, the height of a nest, which reaches up to about four meters above the ground, which is all there to, to catch a breeze that's um, above the, high above the ground that sucks the air through the nest and, and, and induces basically passive ventilation. So these structures that you see all over are entirely driven by generating the, 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 um, the, the updrafts that you need in the center of a nest to cool the central part of the, the structure where the queen lives. If you go to Africa, the termites there, if you saw life on Earth, you'd have seen this nest. This is the... Um, the nest of Macrotermes bellicosus. Um, so, and the queen lives at the center of this nest. She likes to be kept at precisely 30 to 31 degrees centigrade, when the outside temperatures can be from about zero to up to about 45 degrees centigrade. Now, the termites do this by um, adjusting, well, firstly, by building uh, the nest so they have this vast underground cooling chamber. So this is, this is one of our first inspirations for, for, for work. And this cooling chamber looks something like this, these spiral fins. The air comes into the nest down these tubes uh, down these, um, these ducts, and it comes in through the side walls down to this underground chamber where the thermal mass, the, the mass of the earth, keeps the, the air cool. And some of the termites have the job of being animal volume control dampers, which is an exciting job, but they basically block and unblock these kind of forearm-sized holes in response to temperature stimuli from the queen, which says too hot, too cold, or whatever, and they increase the ventilation rate, thus drawing cool air down into the cellar where it's um, uh, conditioned before being passed up into the nest, um, at the center of the nest where the queen keeps comfortable. When it gets really hot, the workers have been observed by um, an anthropologist called Yuji Mare, who wrote a wonderful book called The Soul of the White Ant, observed going down to the water table, sometimes 20, 30 meters underground, with a leaf stem or a seed pod with a, with some, and pick up some water, and they bring it back up into this chamber and tip it into this chamber to produce evaporative cooling effects, so to get effectively passive air conditioning. Now, it's tricky finding clients who've got workers willing to wander down to the water table with buckets to keep buildings cool. But the principles of thermal mass, of, of water storage, and so on, are a key part of the work that we've tried to do over the years in developing our, our green buildings. Um, I've gone blank on the name of the, the guy who's doing this. Rupert, Dr. Rupert Saw has been working in Namibia recently, and he's basically filled a nest with plaster of Paris, which seemed a bit cruel to the termites to me, but, uh, and then removed all the earth to try and map all the ventilation passageways inside, and is now slicing it up to try and understand really how it works. Um, this is the back end of the queen. She produces uh, sort of 25,000 eggs a day, so she likes to be kept comfortable while she's performing that task. Um, well, you would, wouldn't you? Um, and um, down here is the other part of the kind of amazing biological story, which is the, the, the food that the, the termites um, grow. Now, we all know that termites eat wood, but actually they find it difficult to digest wood. They bring the wood back to the nest, they lay it down in, in, a, in, in growing chambers inside the center of the nest, and on those growing chambers, they grow a fungus, a mushroom. Um, and they seem to secrete some sort of enzyme onto those, um, onto those growing beds, which stops the mushrooms from germinating, or uh, germinating, I think is the right word, in the, day, in the daytime. And just when, as it starts to get cool at night, they start to produce, the mushrooms start to grow. And at that point, uh, they give off heat. Mushroom farms are very hot places, in case you haven't heard that. So they give off heat when they produce. So they give it basically a passive boiler system that does the heating in the nest as well, as if they weren't clever enough. And then, of course, they get to eat their boiler system as well, so it's perfect. <laughs> so um, that's, that's sort of the tale of a termite. Um, no more, no less than that. They're sort of basically the most wonderful um, creatures for, for, as an inspiration for environmental engineers. But the things that we learn from them are about thermal mass, about control of, air, uh, of ventilation, and about um, the use of water, and perhaps the use of biofuel and boilers. And I'll try and show you maybe how we've dealt with that in our projects now in the years, years since. Um, my earliest collaborations were with um, a guy called uh, Neil Thomas. And I don't know if Neil's here. I was hoping he was going to come down tonight from Manchester. But um, he's here. Hi, Neil. <laughs> 
I didn't see him before I started. And we, when we first started out working at Bureau Happold um, back in the uh, early 80s, um, but that old, the, we, we started working on projects like this where there were no pipes or wires or ducts, where the whole control, environmental control of the building, and this was, a, I should mention, is a, is a, port, a mobile theatre for the, uh, the nationalised Steadford of Wales. And we, we used to control the ventilation just by lifting up flaps at the side and opening vents at the top. Very, very simple stuff. So we weren't really doing systems design at all, or I wasn't doing systems design. Um, Neil went on to set up Atelier 1 and persuaded me to set up Atelier 10, and we've been collaborate, keen collaborators ever since. One of our first commissions when we um, started out was to work on the new um, opera house in, in Singapore. Um, Michael Wilford was working on the project just post Jim Sterling era. Um, and um, one of my ex-colleagues from Bath, um, a guy called David Turnbull, was um, working on the, on the model, and they had a problem with kind of solar gain. They're on the equator, they're designing a, uh, an opera house, and they hadn't really, they wanted a glass building, but they couldn't figure out how, to, how, they, how they might shade it. So they asked us to come up with some ideas. Um, we looked at the, the situation on the equator and thought, tricky, tricky, because the buildings were facing in, in sort of the wrong, it was facing, they were both at 90 degrees to one another, so they had all kinds of different solar gain problems different times of day. And I put this slide in to show how simple things were in the early 20 years ago. We used to do everything very intuitively and very much by hand and eye. It was, there was that much less computer modeling then. Um, we took inspiration from the Asian leaf roofs structures. So in our early sort of thinking about this, we started talking about how, how sort of uh, the, the indigenous buildings, vernacular buildings, responded to climate, how they, how they shaded, how they, in this case, just provided a, provided a surface. And we came up with the first idea for a, um, a, a structure that would sit with a glass, the glass skin on the back and then these um, folded metal panels that will become the shading devices. And then we would be able to tune the shading devices to different parts of the structure so that we could actually keep varying amounts of solar gain out depending upon how, um, how, the, how the building was, uh, what we were trying to get in terms of performance out of the building. Neil's guys went off, um, I should say also we worked with a, a young architect called Dirk Zimmerman at the time who was very much part of the creative process of these. We worked to then generate um, this, these forms um, with, with uh, using inflation um, modeling technology and added in basically a, factor, a, a, a family of 10 different shading devices that go around the building. So there's only 10 different types. Um, we had many trips backwards and forwards to Singapore enjoying their enormous meetings of 60, 70 people to try and get these things through. They love to have very big meetings in Singapore. Um, it was one of the most terrifying experiences of our young lives. But soon after, within, within a few years, um, we had this very iconic structure that had appeared on the skyline that is now, if you get a Singapore Airlines brochure, you find, um, uh, you find this, is the, this is the picture. If you go to the building, you get earrings and jewellery and rings and all sorts of things made of the, made of the, uh, made of the shading panels or made of, look, to look like the shading panels. And Neil and I look on them fondly and, and remember that we actually were sitting in the pub around the corner from the office as we sketched out the first ideas. These first ideas were sketched out for this. Um, and you have five guys who live on it, um, keeping it clean. So they obviously are gainfully employed as well. We went through a full design study on robotic cleaners, and the client said, why would we do that? <laughs> uh, so we have, we have people who live on it. But it, it is, it's a f fantastically iconic building and a very much part now of the Singapore skyline. But this, this geometry and the, the design of this, I, I joke about it, but the design of this is all about shading. It's about actually how can you build a glass building on the equator and, and really not have um, huge amounts of solar gain that cause um, massive amounts of energy consumption. So working with Peter Clegg over the years um, has been uh, a, great, a great joy, one of the great joys of my career. We've worked together for probably 25, 30 years since I first graduated. Sorry, Peter, but that's been that long. Um, and um, one of the projects, the seminal projects really that we worked on was, was the Earth Centre in Doncaster, working with Jonathan Smales to generate sort of the National Centre for Sustainability in, in Doncaster. It's a bit of a mess, this slide, now I look at it from here. But uh, the, 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 the principal element we were looking at was the sort of the buildings here at the centre of the complex. Um, it's called the Planet Earth Galleries, and the challenge here was building on an old coal spoil heap, which is this, building a gallery of about 6,000 square meters to, to host a, an exhibition about sustainable design. Um, at the entrance court is a giant photovoltaic canopy, I think the largest one in Europe at the time, um, designed, I think, with, with Neil and um, Atelier One, uh, and Peter's team with, with um, uh, timber, uh, timber thinnings, forest thinnings, so that it's a very economical um, piece, of, piece of engineering. But the main thing I wanted to talk about was the gallery space, where we first invented the expression of, about a labyrinth. Um, so the, the second part of the title of my talk, The Anthills to Labyrinth, we took the notion of the kind of the underground thermal store from the anthill, and we started to think about how could we make that, how could we make a building that actually performs using thermal mass underground as, a, as, a, as the main way of providing cooling. 
Um, and these were my first doodles from, from 96 that I think we exchanged backwards and forwards by fax with Peter. So what about we do something like this? And, and um, because of the, the ground being very bad, we had to have a very deep floor void. It was going to be solid concrete um, because it, we couldn't put piles down because it was a coal spoil heap and the ground was very unstable. So we basically talked to Neil about building a double slab and we talked about building these, uh, these cross walls that would then become part of a ventilation system. So much like the underworld of the underbelly of the, of the um, termite hill, you have these, uh, these cross walls that provide the cooling. And um, being a lottery project, we did a few back of the, back of the envelope calculations and all of this, <clears throat> and then put it to bed for about two years while they tried to get funding. They then got funding and said, right, you have to start building in three months. We went, oh, God, so is it going to work? Well, ooh, well, yes, we think it will work, because it works for ants. Um, and um, literally, uh, don't tell the government, but that's kind of how it, it started out. It was very much done, we, we actually were modeling the project as we were building it, which was slightly strange. So my early idea that we might have uh, traffic cones filled with rammed earth for additional thermal mass uh, fell out of the story, and we ended up with just a fairly simple, a fairly simple building. Um, also another inspiring image that we found recently, which was from, um, which probably should have come before that last slide, um, was these, um, this is from a, a book from, from Barbara Kender, uh, looks at um, uh, some houses in Italy called the Villa Costozza, and it looks at, it basically has here Prometheus um, with the heat beating down, stolen from Zeus, beating down onto the buildings, these uh, wonderful Italian villas. Um, and uh, Zephyrus, Zephyrus probably is pronounced, uh, blowing, uh, blowing into these caves, this cave system. And here's this wonderful, the air running down through the cave system, popping up through these marble floor grills to provide free cooling into the, the villas Costozza from the, from the um, 16th, 17th century. So there's kind of, there's, there's, there's a lot of history in these. these. These sort of labyrinthine things are probably not new. Like we like to think they're fairly new, but they're really not. So Peter's riposte was, was I think it's Peter's sketch, was a riposte, or perhaps it's a key sketch, but was, a, was the kind of how the, the environmental diagram starts to work. We worked more and more on the glazing, the lighting, the daylighting, the energy story. Um, but then went on to start to build this, this labyrinth where the air comes in through here and passes through these concrete tunnels before coming out through the floor grills to waft cool air around the feet of the visitors to the, to the space. So here we are under construction, a uh, construction worker going, what the hell are we doing here? Um, and, and the building was built and it functioned very effectively for a couple of years. Unfortunately, sadly, the Earth Center um, ticked many boxes about, uh, uh, in terms of sustainability. I think the, the economic sustainability one was problematic, that, it, it, that they will have problems with visitors. I hope the buildings are going to find a new use soon. There's talk of, it, of, it, of various different uses being made for it. It's recently been used for film sets, mostly, um, but it's no longer being used as an environment center. Um, this was the gallery space with the exhibition going on. So we took that idea um, to a competition we were doing in Melbourne at the time with some architects from London who entered a competition for Federation Square, which is this very big development sitting over the rail tracks into Melbourne Station. And we had a particular problem, which was to condition this very large atrium, glass atrium space that linked all the galleries together. It's about 300 meters long, sits above the railway tracks. Um, and <clears throat> there was an idea that, looking at the, the, the weather in, in, um, in Melbourne, it's, it's very hot in the daytime, but it's very cool at night. The wind comes in off the sea at nighttime. So we thought, we've got to find a way of storing this. Could we apply a labyrinth to it? Underneath this enormous piazza, there was a big volume, big empty space that they had nothing to do with. There was no daylight going in there. It was just a big void. And we thought, well, maybe we can find a way to sneak a labyrinth in here. Um, so we sneaked in this, this, we put in this idea. I went down to Melbourne for, to do a presentation on it, and it was in the middle of a, a value engineering session. Anybody in the construction industry means that means cost-cutting, by another word. Uh, so we were going through value engineering at the time, and um, there was blood on the walls. Uh, Aust you've, never, you've never done value engineering until you've done Australian value engineering, which is, is pretty, pretty ruthless, let me tell you. Um, and they um, decided to, I, w I went in rather sort of with my, trembling with my bit of paper, and they, they, uh, they said, how much does it cost? I said, well, it's a couple of million dollars. And um, they said, has Sydney got one? And I said, um, no, Sydney hasn't got one. This will be the biggest one in the Southern Hemisphere. They said, we'll have it. And, and it survived, and this is true, it survived. So knowing your, knowing your enemy is quite an important thing as well, because the, the politics of this were all about cities competing against one another to be the greenest at the time. So this was, to have their own labyrinth was a real big deal for them. So we, we started to build the labyrinth. It feeds air into this atrium space. These brown things here are timber slats in the floor where the air wafts up and displaces the heat up and out to a high level. And this, this is the labyrinth under construction and um, here, and the, these rippled walls which maximize the surface area. So again, it's, it's very inspired by the kind of animal architecture. That's, that's, that's where we start from, and that's really where it, where, it, where it delivered. And we delivered this 10 years ago. It's gone through um, 
a series of really searingly hot summers. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, so we've had summers here where it's been 45 degrees outside centigrade. Without any refrigeration, we're delivering uh, temperatures of 22 to 24 degrees inside the atrium through just delivering the air through these tunnels. Now, if sustainability is also about intergenerational thinking, this is not just about replacing this, you know, taking out equipment that we didn't have to put in this time. In 20 years' time, in 40 years' time, in 60 years' time, when they do plant replacements and redo all the cooling systems, this, this, this kit, this stuff will still be there as part, of the, as part of the environmental story of the building. They now do, they didn't put anything in there to, get, to let people go in. There's no lighting or fire escapes or anything. Um, uh, and uh, they now have to, they now do guided tours on a Sunday morning because it's such a popular, such a popular part of the, of the scheme that people go and do a tour of a labyrinth on a, on a Sunday morning. So beware of the minor tour and the tra trails, of, trails of biscuit crumbs are everywhere to be seen, I'm sure. So the, the important thing, of course, about it, though, environmental performance-wise, is what's it doing? That the outside, here you've got a day and night temperatures going up and down, up and down, and this is the temperature of the air coming out of a labyrinth. So we're using this concrete just as a big attenuator just to stop the swings in temperature. And almost anywhere in the world, except for Singapore or, or Asia, you get conditions like this. London's like this, day, night, day, night, day, night. What we're trying to do is to mediate day to night to minimize the amount of kit that you have to put into buildings to make them work. So that's, it's a fairly simple story, really. We did have the opportunity to build another small one here in the UK uh, with this beautiful little um, alpine house at Kew Gardens, which we built a few years back with, with uh, Wilkinson Air. Um, it sort of emerges into the gardens rather beautifully. It's very small, very modest, um, but very clever, uh, I think. And, uh, it has a sort of a, a natural ventilation system that takes heat away from behind the glass. But it has also beneath it this labyrinth structure, which is very simple, cross walls through which the air is blown to provide all the cooling. But it's, this is a much more complicated building than it at first seems. Um, alpine plants, um, I think I've got a picture of an alpine plant, here we are, um, requires, require about 100,000 lux of light to make them grow. Um, so we in an office building might have 500 lux of light. So it's, it's a massively different amount of light that you need to get in. So here is where a glass building is kind of appropriate because you need that amount of light for the plants. But with that comes heat, and alpine plants don't like heat very much. So they've traditionally been put into refrigerated shelving, so big chillers to keep the plants cool. And the idea here is that we ventilate uh, the glass behind, uh, up the back, and then we just cool the pocket of air where the, where the plants sit, and they keep perfectly comfortable, and they, they're growing very well. The only thing, perhaps we might have chosen the terminals to be slightly more subtle, but um, I'm, we're, I'm getting over that now. Uh, we also have to um, provide a lot of shading in the summertime to keep the heat down. Uh, when the solar gain gets too much, otherwise the, the building will overheat. So it's a very little, it's a little, it's a 108 square meter building. That's a real technical, technological little marvel with working with Wilkinson Air architects. Now we can't always build labyrinths. So one of the things we've started to evolve is a, a system using a slightly un, unfolded labyrinth using an idea, a thing called an earth, earth duct, which may sound rather arcane. These things here are air intakes, and all the air that comes into this office park is runs along uh, concrete ducts that are about 100 meters long that run underground to, again, to connect with the earth, to precondition the air. So they come in through here, they run through these long concrete pipes below the ground, um, like this, and they basically provide all the air conditioning. So these buildings have no air conditioning. They're typical office buildings that have no air conditioning, they just, but they are cool and they're comfortable, and they work in the summer without refrigeration. We're doing it, it's not that difficult. It just involves investing and saying, rather than investing in chillers and fan core units and all that kind of usual kit you put in a building, you invest in something a little more arcane, like burying things under the ground. So this is just about, it's very, it's embarrassingly simple actually. Maybe it's because I'm, I'm, I'm a simple person. But what happens is this, I'm sorry to bore you with graphs, but I'm going to. But this was, this was from last summer, 20, do you remember the 17th of July? It was about the 20th of July. We had these three consecutive hot days, over 30 degrees, 32 degrees. Well, the air, in the, labyrinth, the air in the earth ducts was coming out at about 17 degrees. Now, it's boring, I know, but it's cool. It's cold air coming out of pipes in the ground that does all that you can do with an air conditioning system, thereby avoiding all that energy that you would otherwise need to put in. Happy people enjoying the cool air. And, um, and, and the fact that that's the investment, these blue pipes in the ground that basically eliminate the air conditioning from the buildings. Why don't we do this everywhere? I don't understand why we don't do it everywhere. Why we don't do it everywhere is because the market is resistant to it and people are sort of nervous about how you might go about this. Here's a case in point. I have to put this in because Thomas, we worked with Thomas on this beautiful building, the, the, the pavilion for the expo, um, but, uh, and the original design for it um, uh, had a nice earth duct to do all the preconditioning because the weather in, in Shanghai at the time we were doing it was, was actually fine for using earth ducts so that we could have conditioned the whole thing using good British earth duct technology until the value engineering came along. 
Um, and sadly, because it was only in use for nine months, the, the earth duct didn't survive the, didn't survive the chop. Um, and so, in fact, we ended up with a, a very nicely integrated, cool ventilation system, but using more conventional systems. And that is, that is sometimes the way things go. But actually, it's still a very beautiful and very wonderful space, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, so I, hope, I don't know if Thomas is here, but it's a, I, I, I know he's not, but it's a, it was a wonderful project to work on with his team and a truly amazing representation of, of, uh, of, of what we can do technology-wise. Working with Ted was altogether a, um, a different experience. Ted, Ted, Ted has um, very strong views about the way that um, uh, people, people relate to buildings. And this building is the new um, National Plant Archive. It's the herbarium at Kew. And our clients here, I'm hoping I've got my slides in the right sequence, our clients here are up to 400-year-old samples from plants, and there's about 8 million of them going into the building over the next 50 years. Um, these are plants that actually are not that sensitive to temperature. You freeze them before you put them into the archive, so they can they stand temperature. But the problem you have with this building is not um, anything to do with temperature, it's all to do with bugs. So because if they get a pest outbreak in the, in the, um, in the uh, herbarium, they get all the plants eaten. So this is a whole new learning experience for us about plants, that are, uh, uh, the way that people, the plants get eaten. Um, and so we have to keep the building the space at about a 16 degrees, 15 degrees centigrade in order to keep the bugs down. Um, and as a result of that, Ted's thing, which was very much about opening up the building and, and letting it breathe, was really difficult for us to do. So we ended up building these kind of very big sealed hermetic boxes. And I should explain, this is the old herbarium, right, before I um, carry on. Um, big, solid, hermetically sealed boxes with great thermal mass that we do actually condition. And then we have um, the, the, the spaces that people occupy are altogether more joyful and, 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 and well lit. And we worked with, with Ted's team to basically locate all the windows using our, our modeling techniques to, that we now have available, which is much more advanced than they were in the early days of Singapore, to produce these, um, the, the, wind, the fenestration is perfectly aligned to minimize the amount of solar gain and sunshine and direct sun falling on the spaces. And where we have got um, sunlight evolving shading systems and so on to make the building absolutely deal with the weather in the best possible way, but still produce a beautifully comfortable, uh, very human environment inside. And then you go to the barrier, which is the barrier where the cells start, where the, where the herbarium materials are stored, which is this solid brick wall, which represents the transition between the kind of light, airy outside and this very dense world where there are millions and millions and millions of plant samples. And it's taken them four months to transfer the first one and a half million samples from the old, uh, old herbarium. The building opened just last week, I think it was, it was last week, and it was a, it's, a fa it's a fabulous building. It's very these are very simple um, cells um, which are environmentally controlled. And then wherever we don't need to environmentally control, we kind of naturally ventilate and naturally light. And the whole building is powered by uh, deep, uh, shallow geothermal wells. So we have um, pipes that go down to, the, down to the water table, suck the water out, take the heat, and, and use that as part of the heating system for the building. So again, a very low, low, um, low energy system. And this is the office up on the top where it's naturally lit, naturally ventilated and very simple and, and, and beautifully lit. Now, to the South Pole. Uh, a few years ago, we did a competition with, with Hopkins Architects and Chris Wise of, of Expedition Engineering um, to build or to design uh, these structures for the, for the Halley Expedition in, in, on the South Pole. Um, sorry, it's the, the Halley Base. And the, the previous five bases or four bases have all fallen into the sea. The fifth base is heading for the sea and it has a crack behind it. So the competition was to design a building that could be very energy efficient, that could um, basically move 10 kilometers every five years to a new location. Now, um, not content with designing a building that would be um, pull up, <laughs> that you could pull with, um, with, with bulldozers, we figured out that it was much better if the building could actually walk to its new location. It's Chris in the room. He's, he's responsible for this. I think, Hello, Chris. <laughs> this was something we did with, with Chris Wise at Expedition Engineering and his team. Um, and these are, these are wonderful animations that we never fail to bring a smile to the face, but there was some really serious environmental thought at work here because every gallon of fuel that has to go down to the South Pole to move the building, to get tractors to drag the buildings across the ice, uh, has to be shipped you know, th hundreds of thousands of miles across the sea. They have to be offloaded onto skidoos, dragged across the ice and snow, and taken into the... Um, and then put into the engines. So there's a vast embedded energy in every litre of fuel that's used. And so the idea of this structure was not only that it would, um, it could, it could actually move itself for less than the energy. Chris would always tell me than a, that of boiling a cup of tea to move a few meters, because you're literally just lifting a hydraulic leg, moving it, and dropping it down again. And it, it saved thousands and thousands of gallons of diesel being shipped down for tractors. Sadly, 
that didn't convince the, um, the British Antarctic Survey, and we came a close second to a scheme, a Hugh Broughton scheme, which has been built and is very wonderful. Um, but we had some other, other very keen ideas on this that were very much about how do you take environment in considerations to a next level. In this case, um, the buildings that you get at the South Pole, the biggest problem they have is keeping them clear of snow, or windblown snow, and they're constantly bulldozing um, snow away. Huge amount of fuel is expended bulldozing the snow out of the way. And so the idea of this form of the building was to be able to push the snow, that the, the wind actually took the snow away from the building and meant that you could carry on, you, you would never get a situation where the building was snow logged underneath, thereby saving lots of, lots of energy. Um, we, the building was conceived as a series of containers that will be shipped down and then will be wrapped in this ETFE wrap to keep the, to keep the um, infiltration and, and, and airflow down. And then we developed a whole energy system based around a combination of photovoltaic and wind generators that would drive a, um, a hydrogen system uh, running fuel cells to, to power the whole building. So we got to the point where we had a, an almost zero carbon uh, energy source. Uh, we had some issues about how we were going to stop the windmills from blowing away in the 200 mile an hour winds, but we were, we were working on that. Um, and so an amazing project that we, we had great fun uh, putting together. Uh, and sadly, we got very close to, to building, but uh, never, never quite realized. But we went on with Hopkins to build probably our, our best environmental building, which is the Croon a forestry school at Yale. Um, and so I've been lucky enough to be teaching over there for about 10 years, and one of the quid pro quos of teaching there is you get to build some of their buildings, um, which is very nice. Um, so this was briefed by the forestry school, and it's a project we started actually in, in 2000 and was finally built in about 2008. Um, but it has all of the things we've kind of learned about doing green buildings in the UK. It has all the, the right amount of glazing, the, the way that the glazing is shaded here on the east and west facades, um, the way that the, the air spills through the building. It's a building that um, naturally ventilates um, during the spring and the autumn, and then is controlled in the, in the, in the summer and winter. So we call that mixed mode. Uh, all this concrete's exposed for thermal mass, for comfort. Um, this thing here is a solar panel that does all the hot water for the bathrooms. On the roof is a very large photovoltaic array that generates a lot of the power. And then here is a machine that does the sort of the job that the watery termites do going down to the water table, um, which is a, called an, an indirect evaporative cooling air handling unit. So it uses basically spray water to, to do the same job of, of free cooling in the hot uh, New Haven summers. This is a, a, a ground source well, again, it's 1,500 feet deep, um, goes down to, down to the water table and drags water out as part of the heating system, and this is all the rainwater recycling. So this one is probably the most complete environmental building that we've ever worked on, but it's also pretty glorious to be in. It's a lo lovely space. Here's more photovoltaic cells on the roof, and it's a, it's a gorgeous building. And I think the point for this project is it doesn't have to be, you don't have to lose anything by doing green buildings. It can be entirely additive. This makes great places to be to work. It's the most popular space on the Yale campus now to go study, and it's, and it's a very, very green building. They have um, little green and red lights that come on around the building, and that you get on your computer if you're a part of the faculty, which tells you is today a natural vent day or is today a mechanical vent day. It's very dull, but that's the students love to engage the building that way. They say, oh, today we can open the windows. So they go open the windows. It's great. Fantastic. And we're just now working with, again, with Chris and, um, and Hopkins, Chris Wise and, and Hopkins on the new uh, Center for the World Wildlife Fund in, in Woking, of all places, the new headquarters, um, which I think will be one of the greenest office buildings in, in the UK when it's done. We hope it's putting together lots of these thoughts with the earth pipes underground and the underfloor air and all those good things as part of the process. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to crack on. Um, Yale has been very kind to me, as I say. This, was my, my, this is my office here at the architecture school. We were lucky enough to get involved in renovating Paul Rudolph's architectural masterpiece that is this building, um, much loved and loved and hated in equal, in equal measure. Um, but I was fortunate um, last semester to, be, to get the Saarinen professorship and teach with, with uh, Andy Bowe um, here on the left from Foster and Partners, um, where we took the, stu the students to do a studio in Marrakesh. Uh, we did eco an eco-resort in Marrakesh. Um, this is a, a view from our hotel, which wasn't too scruffy. Um, but the students just produced the most fantastic work um, that, and, and very, very inspired by the notion, this was Andy on the site, um, very inspired by the notion of how do you integrate sustainability into education, which I know is a key part of, of the RSA's mission um, and very much a part of the things that, that we want to be doing in the future. So um, nearly finally, um, the project that we're currently most, I'm probably mo most involved with is a, a new project just across the bay from the Opera House. Um, this is called Gardens by the Bay in Singapore. Um, if you watch Formula One, the Formula One cars go screaming around here. But this is just across the bay um, where the clients are commissioned, who's the National Parks of Singapore, commissioned a new 55-hectare garden, uh, including two um, enormous glasshouses. Um, I'm working on this also with, uh, with Peter Higgins of, of Land Design Studios. And this is, again, a, new, a whole evolving part of our work about communication of these ideas. We've got some pretty complicated ideas I'm going to tell you about in a minute. 
but Peter's been, we've been working with Peter since the very beginning of the project about how do we get the messaging across to the public who are going to visit this place because um, we've, done some, uh, we've done some pretty complicated things and it's a complicated message to get across and, and um, having a great time working with, with Peter and his, his team in, in sort of communication of green ideas. This is a project that when you look at the visualizations, you kind of go, no, no one's ever going to build this. Um, here we have a, you walk through a, a thing, I'll just go back to the plan. Um, you walk through, come across the bridge here, walk through a thing called the super tree cluster, which is a vertical gardens through the gardens and up to the, up to the main glass houses. So this is a cluster of super trees, 50 meters high, which is a 12 story building high, um, with a, some, one of them's got a cafe on the top, but it's a huge vertical garden for the great flora and fauna of, of Singapore. In the distance is the first of the glass houses. They sit above the bay here. Um, the cool moist conservatory here and the cool dry, uh, sorry, cool dry conservatory here and the cool moist here, and more on that momentarily. So this is, this is the plan of, the, of, the, of those two conservatories. Um, this is the plan of the Alpine House at Kew. So well, after we won the job, we took the client to see the Alpine House. <laughs> he was slightly underwhelmed by the scale of it, but uh, it's all, it's all, all these things are scalable. The whole idea about, about scale is not a difficult one. Um, but our, our challenge, of course, was to build two, very, our challenge for the client was to build zero carbon buildings on the equator made entirely out of glass and cooler than the local climate. So not too much, not too much of a challenge. Um, they have very particular conditions. Again, our clients here are the plants. Um, the conditions were preset by actually a lot of research they've done at Eden um, on, on plant light levels and on uh, the requirements for particular types of European plants to grow. So we have these very high light levels, 45,000 lux, about half the alpine plant, but still very significant. And then particular temperatures and the ability to cool the space down at night to keep it comfortable, uh, sorry, not for comfort, to, to make the plants um, flower. So this was one of the early renderings of the inside. At this point, you start to get a sense of the scale of this building. It's absolutely enormous. It's nearly 200 meters long, uh, 90 meters across. Um, Neil from Atelier One has been responsible for the structural engineering of it. Um, I know he sleeps well. Um, and um, I think he sleeps well, allegedly. Um, and it, it, this, but the, you, know, you can see here the issue. On, on the, virtually, we're five degrees north of the equator, and we have this massive amount of light we're trying to get in, but at the same time, this huge amount of heat. Um, and so we did, and this is a, another view of the, of the cool dry conservatory, the cool moist conservatory has tropical montane plants, so they're still quite kept quite cool, but they need to have um, uh, higher levels of moisture, which is easier in Singapore, inside a 65 meter free falling waterfall in, uh, within the space. So how do we address the challenge? Well, m some of my colleagues who worked with me on this are sitting here in the front row, and I, a lot of credit to, to Meredith, particularly Meredith Davey, who's worked in my office, who's a genius at pr producing all this kind of modeling. Um, and we worked a lot in, in trying to analyze how we put together the shading systems, how we make the structure, the shading, the glass, all work together to make uh, an envir perfect environment for plants. And we came up much to the client's disappointment in some ways, but we came up with the, 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 the harsh reality that in order to make these buildings work, um, to be um, with, with a, a cloudy environment in Singapore, we would have to have uh, an external shading system that would actually cover the buildings in the, um, in the hottest part of the day because we simply couldn't deal with the, the implications of all the light and all the heat. So we went through a huge amount of modeling. I began to put this in just to show the difference between 15, 20 years ago when everything was very intuitive and hand-drawn through to now where we're, doing a lot, we're able to do a lot more an, an analytical modeling of computational fluid dynamics to understand what's going on in the spaces, introducing air at floor level and within the mountain to condition the spaces. And we looked then at what, how, do we how are we going to condition them? How are we going to keep them cool? The I had a chance encounter with a client, the chief of the, of the national parks, who said to me, um, you know, I look after three million trees in Singapore. And I, he said, I have to prune every one every two years. And uh, so that's a lot of trees. And he produces something like 80 tons of wood waste uh, a week, uh, of hardwood waste, just off the pruning of the trees. So we thought this could be our fuel for the whole center. So we, we started to look at the kind of the, the volumes involved and perhaps mixing it with packing case waste to dry it out from the port of Singapore. Um, and so we came up with an idea for this bio, the, the, the whole ecosystem for the, for the, for the center um, that starts with the glass house and says, how could we use heat to cool the buildings? And we use a system thing called desiccant cooling. Now, I may be getting a bit arcane at this time of night, but desiccants, the things you find in, your, in a bag when you buy a camera or a pair of shoes, you find this little bag says, do not eat. Um, that's, a that's a solid desiccant. You get that in liquid form, so you spray that and you basically pass air through it and you end up with more water on the floor than you started with. So you've dried the air out, which in a humid country is what you have to do. So you've got lots of water you need to then boil off. So we, th we needed a source of waste heat to regenerate it that we can then use that to go around and condition the space. So our waste heat comes from this biomass. We take all the wood chippings from the client, we dry it out off-site, bring it to site, 
burn it in a huge boiler, drive a turbine to generate power, take the waste, waste heat from a turbine and put that into drying out the, the desiccant. Um, the, 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 heat, the energy from a turbine then goes into um, a conventional chiller here, uh, which dry, produces chilled water, but also waste heat goes into something called absorption chiller, which produces even more cooling and basically cools the space. So we're able to do a complete cooling of the building using uh, waste heat, if you like, from a, from a burning process, um, using a combination of, of absorption and, and liquid desiccation of the system. So uh, by doing that, we were able to actually delivering this as a zero carbon thing. Now, whether sustainability equals you know, building glass houses and then finding a way to solve the problem is a whole much more complicated argument. But all we can say is we, we kind of tackle what's in front of us, and what's in front of us was a problem, so that's what we had to deal with. So this looks like a project would never get built. Well, here it is on site. Um, and uh, this is it a few, um, just a few, last week. Uh, the cool dry biome uh, pretty much complete, the cool moist going up. That's being planted up in March. Uh, all the plant is in and equipment's in. Um, and um, there's just, it's just an extraordinary construction site. Um, the first of the super trees here constructed just last week. And this was uh, from across the water, um, I say, last week. And you start to see a vague similarity to the architectural renderings, which is always reassuring. Um, and uh, means that we've, it's something like what we've modeled. So that probably is our, in a, in a way, I, I've even missed out lots of the other parts of the story to do with the ash recycling and so on and so on, but it's the, probably the most complete sustainability or environmental analysis that we've ever had to do on a project, on a, on a huge scale. It's a billion dollar project. Um, been a great privilege working on it with an amazing team, and it's truly about collaboration, whether it's with Peter, with the architect, with Andrew Grant, the landscape architect who's the real visionary, with Neil. It's been just amazing. And here's a picture of Neil a couple of weeks ago with one of his smaller bits of steel um, on the project. And... Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's just great for us to have come from there to here. So finally, um, work we're doing at the moment, um, in, in working with other RDI with, with um, um, Paul Williams, Stanton Williams, uh, looking at the, um, st we've got some grant money to look at sort of post-climate change analysis on um, a building they're currently building for the, um, for the um, St. Martin's, uh, Central St. Martin's School of Art and Design, locating them up at King's Cross. And we're looking at basically climate, climate change avoidance in the future taking on the modeling we've done on designing the building in the first place and trying to project that 50 years into the future to see what impact that's going to have on the buildings. And we're having a lot of fun looking at how we can perhaps turn our rather more sort of lumpy, concrete materials, starting to use nanotechnology, aerogels, the lightest insulation, translucent insulation known to man, how can we start to move that into a modern materials age? So this is just something that Paul and I have recently embarked upon and, and Stanton Williams have recently embarked upon, and it's proving to be very interesting, great fun and we'll let you know how it all works out. My closing thoughts, really, the future the future's an, an amalgam of, of what we already know and, and what technology is starting to bring forward. And only by really working together collaboratively and with mutual respect and a mutual understanding of the status of people within the design team and a mutual respect for ideas can we engender the step change that we need to bring about to, to make... Uh, a greener future and to fulfill our carbon commitments. This cartoon comes from 1976 from um, Hellman in, in, um, in the Architects Journal. And it's incredible that it's, a, it's been around such a long time. But it's, it's that, that thought about, um, they, they say it's not an exact science, we're getting better at it. Um, but how wrong can we afford to be? And finally, um, Buckminster Fuller was an honorary RDI in 30 years ago. Um, Bucky's one of my, one of my heroes. Um, and his, his, I think he should always have the final word in all these kind of lectures. Um, and his final word, if you can read it out without getting a frog in your, like a lump in your throat, is to say, if the success or failure of the planet and of human beings depended upon how I am and what I do, how would I be and what would I do? Thank you very much.